уважаемые дамы и господа. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue the 12th International Scientific Conference Zinoviev readings. Part 2. Olga Mironovna Zinoviev is on the stage. This spelled out idea becomes an act today. And the wise people speak about that objectively. Each of us would have certain measure of things, and this is the moment of truth for each of us. Our unique main protagonist, Alexander Zinoviev, who devoted all his life to truth. He was awarded a special medal for the being loyal to the truth. And that integrity is the main feature of his creative biography. Alexander Zinoviev, great Russian thinker. Today, at the International Press Center of uh, Russia, Siwa, not only we thank the members of the Zinoviev community, but we continue to elaborate and strengthen the roadmap and, uh, of initiatives and projects uh, within the year of Zinoviev. We are glad that present here is the director of the International Organization Center for Political Analysis and Information. Security Sviatoslav Andrianov. Mr. Andrianov, over to you. Let's sign an agreement on cooperation with a non profit partnership biography institute named after Zinoviev. Thank you for being with us. In another historic hallmark, and probably this is only a beginning. And now we have to bear in mind uh, we are short on time. Mr. Andriana, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, being introduced to the works of Mr. Zinoviev and uh, being introduced to Olga Zinoviev uh, did not start for me long ago. And as far as I don't have any scientific degrees, it was very difficult for me to appreciate his ideas. But I trust my father, who is doctor of philosophy, and I came to him and said, Dad, what can you tell me about Alexander Zinoviev? Is he a dissident or a dissenter? And he said, no, Alexander has now been a dissenter. He's been a visionary, and he just anticipated his time. And then, when I read his works, I realized that they are intertwined with my perceptions and resonate in my heart. We all are living in a very hard times today from that podium. It's been said more than once, repeatedly said things that were true for many, many years. When Russia faced an existential threat to its existence, 
what was supposed to be implemented long ago now is no longer discussed publicly but translate into the open space. We are now spreading out what we felt for those 30 years ever since the collapse of the USSR. Only thing I would like to say, Alexander Zinoviev was a visionary and he uh, was the precursor of his time. And I call on you to to be such precursors. Uh, sooner or later the special military operation will be over just like any war ends. And I'm confident that Russia has always been part of the European world, but not the Europe that now tries to put us on our knees, ascribe to us a status of a younger partner, as used to be 1990. But I'm in the old Europe. We have always been part of that old Europe. Last week, at one of the villas, uh, Como Lake, I uh, participated in one very interesting discussion with the Italian military. It was dedicated to the future of the German armed forces. While I'm speaking about that, it was surprising for me to discover how many among the active and reserve officers there who understand what is going on. But in our one-on-one -on -one talks, they admit that they cannot do anything about that, because the freedom of speech that we were lectured for many years, it has become a dummy. The freedom of speech does not exist in the West, because there are certain discourse, there are certain ideological maximas. And if you take any position in the public space, and if you doubt this or that ideology, you would be subjected to cancel culture. What I'm driving you to, when the conflict in Ukraine is over, we have to think already now how we're going to interact with Europe. Because neither Germany nor France nor Italy now do not have that image of future, something that we need badly. I cannot imagine a situation when Russia is totally decoupled from Europe. This is not possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have to interact with Europe. And again, I mean the real old Europe with its normal values, not the neoliberal discourse that is being imposed on us. And give me 30 seconds more. Again. What I deem necessary for us, what we are lacking, and this has been said in the Council of Federation and in the State Duma and to all the chambers of the Russian Parliament, uh, do not see any progress in that theory. Probably what I'm going to tell you uh, would not be agreed with anyone. I think that we badly need to get a good ideology in its good sense, positive sense. But the ideology that we do not replicate from certain discords, but we have to have our own ideology would be developed by, well, that would rest on our huge historic experience. Bear in mind our great Russian soul, that people would understand what they're living for. The warriors would know what they are dying for, and the wars are won not with weapons, but with our blazing hearts. This is what I would like to see in the future. This is something I call you on. Thank you. Friends, apart from what uh, Svetlstov Andriana said, I'd like to add, we have uh, enormous creative legacy of Alexander Zinoviev, one of the hallmark books in his legacy, which now we have in our hands, which is being published in the 44 volume strong collection of his pieces. This is a book called Do I Bother You? Which is called The Ideology of the Party of the Future. This is not, uh, this is about the attitude towards your own fate, the attitude towards your living through that admitting our 
past and our present. We have to move forward, bear in mind all the ups and downs, all the victories and defeats. We have discussed that openly. As for Europe is concerned, until today it remains in shadows as was predicted in the 19th century. Therefore, signing that agreement, this is one step forward for me in our promising dynamic decision to explain to the Europeans what freedom is about. This is what we're going to explain to the Western world, what democracy is about, what patriotism is about, and what real citizenship is about. We have to live an adult life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bravo. Let it be so. I'm in. Zinoyev Club, Russia Sivonian you know, Organizing Committee. Go on receiving video addresses. One of them would be shown on the screen. German philosopher and publisher, political scientist, doctor of philosophy, specialist in history, Hauke Ritz, would make a pitch in front of us. Esteemed Olga Mironova, esteemed participants in our today's conference, uh, marking the centenary since the birth of Alexander Zinoyev. Unfortunately, I cannot be present with you because I'm publishing a book in Kemani. I apologize for go continuing in English of Alexander Sinovev coincide with one of the biggest crises of human history, at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis and maybe even since the Second World War. The work of Alexander Sinovev is astonishing because he correctly predicted such a development. Even more so, he showed in detail the deeper reasons why the United States of America and uh, the Western world as a whole needs to seek the confrontation with Russia. His work is suitable to understand that those reasons are not only connected to the path of socialism or the geography of various continents, but are connected to questions about the future of human culture and human civilization itself. Should the 21st century be a century of a global oligarchy, which would if she is successful, guide human culture and human civilization into a direction which would suit its demands and its interest? Or should the 21st century be a century of state and statehood, where the state is strong enough and able to rule over an oligarchy, prevent its rise and reverse its influence? For some reason, those questions are connected to the existence of Russia and the Russian statehood. And Alexander Sinovev already understood this in the 1980s during the time of Perestroika, when most intellectuals on both sides of the Iron Curtain believed into the promises of a liberal world order. And for this reason and many other reasons, which I cannot mention here, uh, we honor today the 100th anniversary of this uh, great son of Russia, the philosopher Alexander Sinovev. Um, I'm greeting you from Germany um, and wish you uh, a, a successful conference in Moscow. Thank you very much and my best wishes. Thank you so much for such a welcome address. But it must be said that many participants, uh, both online and offline, I uh, speak in different languages, but they think alike as you know your manner. And this is a natural, objective fact. Because unlimited intellectual heritage that we get from Zinoviev books would bring together the people from different continents, different uh, trades, professions, and interests. The first uh, bibliography prepared by Alexander Zinoviev Club. We have more than 70 books published in 28 languages. 
and this list is not full. The International Society of Zinoviev Ant Hill uh, is not complete, and uh, we have not listened to all the countries in the first part of the conference. One of the full-fledged participants uh, in that club is Mr. Charles Bausman, director of AVG Capital and Partners, who invests into major business projects in the area of agriculture. He is the author of Russian Insider website, which publishes alternative to most of the mass media of the West point of view related to Russia. Mr. Bausman, welcome to that stage. Over to you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to say a few words. This is an honor and privilege for me. So many nice people, and we have to respect them endlessly. And among these people, including Olga Zinovieva, I always ask them, Tell me whether Zinoviev is so multifaceted. I'm an American journalist, and of course, it's very difficult to, to be explained in a couple of words. I got many such words and uh, statements. And one of his traits of character was uh, being totally intolerant to lies. And he valued the truth. It was very important for him to tell the truth, regardless of the consequences. Some people respected him fully. And a couple of minutes ago, actually, we were told that he believed in truth and he was loyal to the truth. And this is a very Christian idea. A Christian, if he doesn't tell the truth, would go directly to the hill. This is commandment number nine. And this is so important for our world. Wherever we look, we see all lies. And this is why I gave up my business career. I had to set up my publisher house because I couldn't tolerate that these lies that I would find in the Western media. It was years ago, and unfortunately, the situation exacerbated over those eight years. It is so important now that Russia could raise its voice in that media landscape. As been said by the previous speaker. Sometimes people cannot say anything out loud, otherwise they would lose their position at their career. But as far as I understand, uh, Zinovi would say, that's OK, just tell the truth and quit that job. But many people do not want that. But Russia can say that out loud. And Russia has real clout. Your president is very much respected, and he's very popular both in Europe and the United States. This is an illusion to believe that uh, Putin is a bad guy and Russia is bad. People abroad are waiting for the truth, that someone strong stands up and tells the truth and calls a spade a spade. And Russia has to do that. Am I not speaking too long? Can I do that? Yes, yes, really, I have something to tell you. Three weeks ago, when your president called the West uh, being ruled uh, with uh, Satan's elites, and it caused uh, a whole mess in the West because lots of people uh, just admired uh, these words. And I think that he had to say that five years ago, 
And thanks God uh, he at least told us these things now. So get back to the idea of telling the truth. There, there is a reason why the situation is worse now. It's this time when everyone has access to information. Twenty, fifteen, ten years ago, we would never recognize the truth in many of the situations, but now we see that clearly. To defend their positions, our Western elites have to lie more and more as they talk to their people. This problem existed 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20, 10 years ago. People always lied to each other, but now it's spreading like cancer. In conclusion, let me say that Russia is the last bulwark of humanity. If Russia leaves the world arena for any reason, without having stopped this uh, appalling situation that we are facing in the West, there'll be no hope, I'm afraid to say, to say it. That's why Zinoviev's words are so important today as we commemorate him. We need to tell the truth out loud for the whole world to hear. Thank you. Athanasius Filipovich, an ancient writer, he once said, truth defeated lie. Let it be so. Another member of the Zinoviev Club, an expert in methodology and a speaker at our events, he wrote many publications and comments in the media. I'm talking about Iskander Valitov. Dear Olga Zinovieva, friends and colleagues, congratulations on this great occasion, on this great day, and we keep hearing today about how Zinoviev's ideas could be used today and developed further. Let's ask ourselves, what would Zinoviev say today? How would he analyze and think about the current situation? If there's a chance, Alexander can still hear us and see us and see what we do here. I think the very fact that someone attempts to uh, continue along with his ideas and thoughts, he would be glad. Let's try to do that. It's not that easy. Sergei Markov mentioned how we need to find two quotes from Zinoviev that would be really famous. My choice would be the turn of the brains, turning them around, turning the brain around. That's the one of the basic ideas of his teaching. That's when you are prone to reflection. 
you follow a certain path and you look forward and then you need to stop and turn your brains around 180 degrees and then perhaps you could start from scratch if you change your mind and that's when you get something new and that's how I understand Zinoviev when he said I was talking about I was talking about turning your brains around he, if he lived today he would his thinking would not be linear it would not be yet another novel or a book on a textbook on logic he would turn his brains around and we would see him in an unusual light to try to imagine how and where he would turn. We call him an artist, a sociologist, and a logician, a philosopher, and what not. But what kind of person he really was Those people, they started not by some traditional problems in logic or philosophy. They had a different start. They tried to respond to a challenge that they had at that time the challenge of global scale, the social and cultural situation. What was the social and cultural situation back then? What is that challenge that we need to respond to? And it was expressed in a rather simple manner. The world is fragmented, is broken into different parts, lots of engineering disciplines, social practices, each one is pushing the others in their direction. There's no harmony, and it's also dangerous. And they also said the situation was worse. There's no intellectual pro platform for integration. Every discipline, every scientific discipline says, oh, you need to use our terminology. That's what the challenge was, to find this platform. Here I use a modern language. To find that intellectual, intellectual platform for our integration. And I think it was only logical that Zinoviev turned to the uh, legacy of Marx and Marxism. If we talk about middle of the previous century, there's no, there was nothing more powerful that could be used as such integrating platform besides Marxism. Marxism was the last spillover of German, or let's call it European philosophy. He worked on Marx in a particular way. It wasn't about class struggle or capitalism against socialism. Zinoviev was trying to figure out the intellectual methodology that was the foundation of Marxism. What was Marx's uh, method of thinking? This was a scientific method. For, to be sure, Marx was a scientist, and he was using the scientific methodology as Zinoviev defended his uh, doctorate thesis and his uh, students, they went beyond those original limits. He sort of went into this post-scientific thinking. They call themselves 
post-Marxists. And this new type of thinking that never existed before, this was an absolute innovation in the European culture and civilization. That's exactly what can be used as this intellectual platform that allows you to design anything, put together anything, and giving you freedom to interact with any active systems. And this new method of thinking is largely based on the category of activity. Marx just had an idea, and they developed a theory of thinking. And one more innovation, they added another category, category of a system, and what they call now system and action-oriented approach. And they were dealing with the entire basic problem of humanity. Plato came up with this idea of the state, and then it took around 400 years before that idea was accepted and implemented in Rome. Plato's ideas of the state were implemented in Rome 400 years later. Let's take Christ. Christ's teaching looked esoteric when during his lifetime, and then three, four hundred years later, it was turned into a teaching. So those people, Zenoviev and others, they dealt with the problem of this fragmented world, and hundreds of years later, it will become a major teaching. What would he say today? He, he would not be working on something that had already been done. Zinoviev and his students, I think, they would turn to the current situation. Where's the main tension there? I think we need to refocus here. The human being is lost in today's world. They thought it was done in the Age of Enlightenment when religion was responsible for someone's image. They had the idea of God and how a human being is described in God's terms. And the religion did not study a human being. It just uh, uh, described how the person should be. But then later on, with uh, Descartes, when who said, let's forget about religion. And if, instead of treating a human being as a divine uh, creation, let's uh, simply look at it, at the human being from the scientific uh, point of view. Descartes and uh, Galileo, they lived at the same time. And that's where human beings were lost. And you know. If uh, you lose your image of uh, being human, then everything is permissible, and nothing makes sense anymore, because the meaning of one's life depends on what you're trying to reach. And that was lost. Whatever we see in the West today, this entire Satanism, this is a logical consequence of the fact that we lost this image of human nature, humanity, that 
has to be hot as as bright as hot iron. And I think Zinoviev and those around him would turn to that problem and would work on that. Zinoviev and his students were able to adjust their original anthropology to the question of man's origin. Marx already dealt with that issue of the process from the of from the ape to a human being, and M Marx was talking about labor that made an ape into a human being. But it's not wasn't just labor; it was more like thinking. I, I know I'm out of time. My final words would be as follows. We need to turn to the metaphysics of the human being to answer the question, what else makes us humans besides brain and intelligence? If we want to live in a world of uh, diversity without wars, we need to keep answering this question about the meaning of a human being. An, o an old friend of Zinoviev, club head of two major Moscow libraries, Bogolubov and Losev libraries, he uh, changed the life of libraries in Moscow, and he hosted the Zinoviev Anthill projects, different events at the Bogolubov library, and the Losev Library. There is Vladimir Semyonov. Welcome. Dear Olga Zinoviev, friends and colleagues, finally we have crossed this threshold and we are celebrating the centenary. And lots of things were happening, and we were looking forward to this day that once again shows us the importance of this event for this entire year. We kept talking about these events that preceded this today. In the last several years, Alexander Zinoviev was discussed in the center of Moscow, and there were, there were exhibitions and lectures all over Russian regions in Moscow. He was quoted in the State Duma and the, in Moscow's libraries, lots of cultural institutions discussed him. And it shows us how many faithful followers he has. There are very few philosophers today with so many followers. Philosophers who would have so many smart and intellectual supporters. It means that Zinoviev's ideas are much in demand today. Great ideas, they get appreciated centuries later, centuries after they get generated and 
Zinoviev is a person of enormous scale. And here, the role of Olga Zinoviev is particularly important. It is your enthusiasm, your ability to unite friends and supporters that made this whole thing possible. This is truly an important moment. We can see and feel how we move the Zinoviev's ideas forward into the future. The centenary is a major event. We welcome all of you on behalf of the Russian Pen Center and the libraries and the Lossif Library, uh, the only f library of philosophy in Russia. Thank you again. Vladimir, please stay on the stage for a little bit longer. Let us give you well-deserved awards. A medal commemorating 100th anniversary since Zinoviev's bed. And his portrait carved in marble. Our congratulations. Уже несколько лет. For several years already, and for fledged member of uh, Russia, сегодня is a well-known Serbian journalist, editor in chief of Anti Press, Slobodan Despot. As far as I know. In order to make a presentation, he has prepared a whole report, and please outline that in brief to us. Mr. Slobodan Despot, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not uh, read my report. I will be very brief and very modest. Humble on such a day, in front of such guests and in front of such a person as Zinoviev, you have to be brief and humble. Let me tell you one thing. I met Zinoviev for the first time when I was a translator of Nashdom publishing house, who published a lot of his books for many years prior to my joining that profession. I was 2022. Let me tell you about an event which is very typical of Zinoviev as a personality. We were at a book fair and next to the university, we organized a kind of uh, meeting about the perestroika literature. And so the organizers couldn't dare invite Zinoviev because he would say something courageous, something significant, something which was totally inappropriate. But Zinoviev was in the room among the audience, just like you are. Uh, along with uh, Vladimir Dmitrievich and me. And suddenly, when the organizer who is sitting there in that room, it would be funny to speak about these people without inviting them to the stage, because that was the most important Russian writer, philosopher, was there among the audience, and he was to be given the floor, and he said several phrases uh, destroying everything. He said, this you are Moscow publisher who speaks about the freedom of speech, about how hard he works to promote philosophy. He censored and edited my texts usually referring to the people he met and who were well-known professors, politicians, most important people of the West. 
he would tell them the truth. If that's a silly person, he would say, you are silly. If he saw that there is an idiot in front of him, he would say, an idiot, or a ruffian. And it is not appropriate in the West. You are not supposed to do that. You cannot call an idiot an idiot and survive. This was very hostile, but Zinoviev could spell that out, not with anger, but with a kind of a smile, just as if this is the real truth about that person, that it was the real truth. And for me, as a young student and uh, worker of that publishing house, it impressed me very much. It helped me in my life to learn to tell the truth. And you know that uh, Hans Andersen fairy tale about, yeah, it is a fairy tale about uh, the king, emperor being naked without clothes. And when the child says that uh, the emperor has no clothes and Zinoviev keeping smiling was like the child from Andersen's fairy tale which was not appropriate in the West. And everyone who met him there, everyone who had such energy and power to follow that example, they dared to see that the emperor is not dressed. Why the emperor was undressed? It was in a sense that in the West there is no science. And Zinoviev said that out loud. He said that science is allowed to exist only if it is useful for the authorities. Once it is not useful for the authorities, one, it does not benefit money, there is no science. And we think that the Western science does exist. He just discovered that, and it was uh, as evident as uh, the Holy Bible, or Gospel. And ever since I decided to follow his example in France, this is my language, this is my culture. Several books were published, and I'm confident that these were the people who read Zinoviev very carefully. For instance, uh, Jean-Paul Briguerie book, which was titled The Factory of Fools, or Fool's Factory. Then a political philosopher, Jean-Claude Michel, published his book called Teaching the Silly Things, or Ignorance. And now, 20, 30 years ago, ever since these books, which provided an in-depth analysis of what is going on, now we see the uh, results the, of the, the output of that uh, fool's factory, what Zinovia predicted in his books when he said that suddenly that the mankind would die of the silly things it does. But now, these silly things are dominating in the West. And you probably saw an excellent example of that. This February, when the British Foreign Secretary arrived to Moscow, and we uh, laughed a lot, she acted as a clown. She didn't even know that Voronezh is in Russia. And she is of my generation, but that generation is now reigning in the West. And uh, this woman is devoid of uh, the common sense. What uh, Zinoviev said that he, he was courageous enough in order to call a full person a fool. And if these people were courageous enough uh, to do that, in the West, we could save that Western world, but they actually have no power to say that the emperor is uh, not having dress. This is all I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Every single of you.
uh, reading is preceded by big organizing work, just like in case of Olympic Games or the World Cup. Next, the international conference is being organized immediately. The previous one is over. This uh, year, social reality called life, and that the Zinoyev at the time dedicated all his life to that. Presented to all the members of the Zinoyev Aunt Hill a pleasant surprise initially. Our guest, the guest of that conference, head of Zinoviev Club of Nova Russia, was introduced to the list of foreign speakers and was to represent Donetsk People's Republic today after the well-known events of uh, September 30th. He is a present here as a representative of uh, the DPR, but within Russia, Mr. Bukhtiev. Welcome. Good afternoon, friends, comrades, and colleagues. I'm overwhelmed with feelings, and uh, I can tell you a lot, but I know that we are short of time. But before I say a few words about Zinoyev, let me say that among us present is a great woman, a great historical figure in our life, the one who tries to comprehend the philosophical idea of Zinov, that's Olga Zinoviva. She did a heroic deed. On the wings of her initiative, she broke through the wall of silence, and she managed to come up with such a great result, and we're witnesses to such a result. Thank you so much. Donbass is fighting. In Donbass, it is scary, and there are lots of concerns, and we have no water, and civilians are suffering. Soldiers are doing their duty in Donbass. The ideas of Zinoyev emerged in late 1990s. Books by Zinoyev emerged, and these became more relevant when Olga Zinoviva arrived to Donbass, when after the first meeting, we met in Moscow. Ever since she visited Donetsk several times, we spent Zinoyev reading several times there. We got from Zinoyev Club more than two and a half thousand books written by Zinoyev. Then Pavel Gubarev picked up that idea, and he's a soldier now as a private soldier. Gavrilov, uh, Professor Gavrilov joined that movement, and we were publishing a journal, Factor of Understanding, sponsored by Olga Mironova, Mironovna, and the collection of uh, books was published as well, but uh, the war suspended this cell activity. All in all, Donbass uh, is a country of tough people where some cruel things may occur, but it is beautiful not only because of its nature, its people, its powerful economy, but it is beautiful because of its spirit. And I don't have to tell you about the spirit of Donbass, which is fighting now against uh, the Nazis. Donbass has always been inclined to fight for a man. And this is something I would like to stress. And next thing I would like to underline. When we work with the students, with the young people, with other categories of the people, what would be the ideas? As uh, Mr. Dazibao said, that 
when such ideas would be crystallized in the minds of young people. For some young people, these ideas were full of paradox. For instance, Mr. Zinov would say that if, well, you can enter the same river as many times as you want, and uh, that the argument uh, gives birth to a truth. Now, it only maintains a dispute. And there is a problem of super society. But in that sense, Mr. Zinoviev would make a great discovery. And I would like to continue his idea. So the emergence of the super society in the history of mankind, what happened? The falling took place. The history now is manageable. And he writes a whole report on that. And now that's an evolution war, an evolution war for the future. It would determine how the future would look like. And it is based by the clash of civilizations. And the last thing I'd like to say, Mr. Zinoviev speaks about the normalization of society. What it means? Hmm. When you would enter in the regular algorithm of your life activity, and when you follow the rules and laws, Mr. Zinoviev several times stressed it is not enough to work with the consciousness, but you have to know the consciousness mechanism. Without that, it would be minced meat instead of brains. And this is a manageable history, this understanding, the problem of normalizing the society. And we make mistakes because of that. Uh, not always we understand that, uh, the essence of that mechanism. It has always been a big, big problem for us. If we understand that the situation and uh, something in front of us, huh? Zinov would say that it's been falsified. The past is falsified. The future may be whatever you want. This is very easy to predict the future, but the problem is the present. And as far as we understand the present, uh, the right decisions we would take. This is just like a doctor. A doctor would take indications following certain technique from the patient, and it depends on him whether the diagnosis is right or not. And not always we succeed in that. And once again, I would like to extend my gratitude to Zinoviev Aunt Hill. This is just like River Volga. It starts from it's spring, and it should flow for thousands of years for the sake of Russia. We will prevail, always. We will prevail. But I'm not done yet. I said that uh, Donbass is not just in fire. This is really, is, this is a remarkable country. I would like to give us a present to my native Zinoviev Aunt Hill, this unique photo album for you to remember us <laughs> thank you thank you so much unique case of loyalty to science and academic longevity a legend of the soviet philology professor. He's working at the Institute of Philosophy of the Russian Academy of Sciences, a remarkable Soviet and Russian philosopher, specialist in the history, philosophy, dialectics, and uh, logics. He cooperates with the Zinoviev Club for many, many years. David Johadze.
Sergaya Olga Mir uh, dear Olga Zinovieva, distinguished colleagues, <laughs> we celebrate a major occasion here today. It's, in a sense, a Soviet celebration, and we need to thank our president for remembering this day, and he made it possible that we are invited to the centenary of Alexander Zinoviev. The ball is on the side of other presidents, and we send our guests, or used to offer our guests to the entire continent of Europe. Anyway, Zinoviev is important, really important, not just for Russia, but for the entire world. Zinoviev came back, returned from the West when the army of NATO occupied Yugoslavia, and he realized that they would be breaking up the Soviet Union into parts, and he felt that it was against Russia. He actually felt and he predicted that this would happen, and he did. He made lots of other predictions. I know I have very little time. Someone said here today, the way that we can do all this, talk about Alexander Zinoviev, is thanks to his spouse, Olga Zinoviva. Alexander Zinoviev once visited a workshop of mine at the Institute of Philosophy. And he spoke about Aristotle and there were there was this discussion of a family and there was he was asked about his family and the role of the family in his life. And he said immediately, my family is the number one reason for all my achievements, personally and career-wise. Let me just once again give a round of applause to Olga Zinovieva. She's not just a spouse and a like-minded friend, and also the, the hand of Alexander Zinoviev. I, I don't want to, to take too much of your time.
as soon as soon as that presidential decree was issued about celebrating the centenary, we immediately got together and decided to follow it. I apologize for being too emotional. Let me read to you what we've been discussing. Uh, it is my request to our government and to our Ministry of Education and Science These may be simple requests to follow on the presidential decree. Okay, point number one. We need we need to s s set up the University of mm, International Relations, named after Zinoviev. The problems of ethnic groups and nations are very important. In other words, the suggestion is to set up a university named after Zinoviev. Our second request is including the Zinoviev's works into the official curriculum of Russian universities specializing in humanities. Also, at the level of Russian Academy of Sciences, we need to, we need to encourage candidate of sciences and doctorate of sciences uh, dissertations on Zinoviev's legacy. There is a an institute of philosophy under the Russian Academy of Sciences, and there we also need a special section named after Zinoviev. Zinoviev fought for friendship of nations of the great Soviet Union. I think this would be a great thing if we do it. They have separated us and now they're killing us. My fifth point about about publishing some of the old books by Zinoviev. My sixth point We need to erect a monument and organize a photo exhibition and personal memorabilia and items of Alexander Zinoviev, and also to name a special reading hall at the Institute of uh, Philosophy after Zinoviev. And we discussed all those points, and we proved why it has to be done. Why do we need 
a monument to Zinoviev next to the entrance to the Institute of Philosophy. And that's, it's not just, it has to be a rather big monument, not just a small, tiny one. Thank you. David Johadze, a medal and a portrait. and a bust of Alexander Zinoviev. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. David Viktorovich is Let me just say a few words about the special role David played in our life. He was the only person in the Institute of Philosophy in 1976. Back then, he was secretary of the Communist Party organization in the city of Kutaisi. He sent a letter of protest when the Soviet leadership at the Institute of Philosophy began to oppress us. He was the only one who protested the campaign against Alexander Zinoviev. He was the only one who raised his voice opposing that. And there was an exhibition at the Russian archives of social and political history right across the street from the Federation Council. And there is still that letter. Uh, it was exhibited there. Thank you, David, for your courage back then. Here in this room, we have a diplomat of Russia. He headed the Russian cultural house in Paris, which where the first Zinoviev event was held this year. And I mean, Konstantin Volkov, welcome to the stage. All right, he is not here. Our next guest, there's a school of conflict studies in Moscow headed by Lubov Tsoi, the main expert in conflict studies here in Russia. She is a well-known expert on methodology and these uh, topics. Let me express three main ideas. Remember, one of the presenters asked a question, what would Zinoviev say today? Which questions he would raise? And the first question is about the challenges of today. The whole situation today is about whether Russia will continue to exist or not. And it's all about wars and conflicts. 30 years ago, Zinoviev said that the humanities should be dealing with wars and conflicts, because that's what we will have to live with. The humanities are not doing it. 
they don't even consider such notions as war or conflict. And he also thought a lot about logic of the language. We need to revise our approach to such terms as war and conflict. The humanities do not deal with those issues. Our school has been dealing with those matters for dozens of years, and we need to turn the brain around, the brains around. And now conflict and war are two, are one and the same thing, but we need to separate them. There are conflicts that lead to wars and conflicts that lead to development. Because without development, we will not move forward. And any development is accompanied by conflicts. The modern humanities cannot deal with conflicts. That's why Zinoviev offered the methodology of logical sociology based on nociology, ontology, and logic. And when we start with the terms and basic notions of disciplines, and they are now uh, spoiled with Western terminology. And we need to deal with basic terminology first. That's my first idea. My second point, we cannot start this work until researchers and scholars become absolutely honest. Honesty is how Zinoviev was different from other philosophers. No other philosopher did what Zinoviev did. He, he recognized all his mistakes and errors in understanding the world. This was like public repentance of an intellectual when he made mistakes about Russia or the West. No other person did that. That was a public heroic deed. Everyone defends their theories, their approach, not taking a step back. He is a great example of actions and thoughts. And my final idea, if we want to continue develops, uh, if we want to continue Zinoviev's work, how can we develop them? We need to revise the methodology of all humanities. Only then we will be able to respond to the challenge of modern times. The, we need to preserve conflicts that lead to development. In general, the word conflict is negative. We need to tell, turn conflicts into instruments of development and progress. Let me say at the end that we are preparing a new uh, branch of humanity that I would call a Russian conflictology or methodology of Russia. This is something that we need. Thank you. Our guest from a remarkable city of Chiboksari, or Shupashkari, as it was used to be called before. A unique philosopher who extends what Zinoviev proposed as an independent view of the social reality. Alexander Karpov. Good afternoon, colleagues. 
participants in that conference. My best regards to Olga. I am from the Volga River. Here it is. I am from there. I'm also being impressed by the Saturday party dedicated to 100th anniversary since the birth of Alexander Zinoviev. And I'm still being impressed by the exhibition that was organized there that evening started with the words of introduction said by Olga Zinoviva. And I think that it resonated with many of us. She spoke about love. She spoke about big love of a great Russian woman to a great Russian philosopher. And at that exhibition, on one of the booths, I saw letters written by Zinoviev, who who spoke about his love to Olga. And next to that, there was a bench, and there were a boy and a girl, obviously in love with each other, and invited them to read these letters. Certainly, Zinoviev was a very talented person. And as I see that, he was a missionary, a missionary of the Russian style in the social science. There is no rescue from the poison of love. This is what his protagonist in the Russian tragedy said. Comprehension. This is what gave birth to life. He would say, the truth and truth alone, whole of the truth, at any cost. Truth, regardless of anything. And he said that for many years I was starting the society in which I lived, the communist, the Soviet society. And obviously, I was the first and was the last to build a scientific concept of the communist society. So that the people I belong to, and it's been quoted more and more, that the people I belong to would survive is a historical entity. In the unprecedentedly scary context, we have to be objective in our understanding of the reality that has cropped out. We have only one way out. We have to outwit the West, and it's been repeatedly stated uh, today. We have to outwit the West or develop a bigger creative potential, we need a higher intellectual potential, I'm told. We have to do it now. Now we have more critically important tasks. But now this is wrong. Actually, it is in the period of the public tensions that we see the nascence of new discoveries. 
that the crystals of new knowledge emerge. And I know that Russia now has lots of propositions and projects that would meet the calls for and demands for of this reality. And we have a chance, we have a chance to bring together that dispersed and spontaneous intellectual movement to unify it because we have precious capital. These are ideas and theories, the legacy of Alexander Zinoviev. I'm confident that the Zinoviev Club has proceeding from the big experience it has accumulated in this work to make the next step forward to proceed from the format of a discussion club to a format of a, an R&D center center for intellectual, practical and theoretical work and we have to create an intellectual pro uh, platform which would give us an opportunity to crystallize and consolidate all the healthy intellectual forces here in Russia around our inevitable victory. First of all, spiritual and ideological victory. And then we'll be able to say and to respond to Alexander Zinoviev, you're not the last one. We took over the baton a baton in that intellectual hard relay around the idea of our victory. And we should not miss this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Among the participants of our scientific conference was a, a postgraduate student of Moscow State University, author of one of the theses dedicated to Alexander Zinoviev. We know that his further work would be focusing on the legacy of Alexander Zinoviev, Sergei Luchinian. Good afternoon, everyone. I graduated from the postgraduate studies of four PhD courses of the philosophical department of the Moscow State University. Very soon, I'm going to defend my thesis on the problems of the philosophy of Alexander Zinoviev. Let me present to you my report. Alexander Zinoviev is known for the new terms that he introduced in the social philosophy. That uh, the Westernism, the super society, human anthill, uh, community laws, post Sovietism. One of these terms will be explained in more detail in my presentation. This is heuristic concept of a human anthill in the logical sociology of Alexander Zinoviev. 
the category of a society is one of the most important for the social arts. Is a systemic for philosophy and uh, sociology. Theodor Adorno wrote that uh, sociology focuses on the knowledge of the society. Well, this is a science of society. This is for the first time that we meet that term in the 14th century. Initially, it meant the society as a, a partnership or as, as an association of people, for instance. We would speak about the high society or the scientific society. And then once social science emerged, this term acquired a more scientific flavor. For instance, Emile Turgay said that society is a supra-individual reality which exercises some pressure on certain individuals. And such a broad interpretation of society would imply some supernatural and uh, movement of matter is still encountered in the philosophical books. But this term does not meet number of questions. How do we tell the difference between the society and non-society? For instance, the primordial flux of Pax or any social historical entity can be considered a society, can we call a society, some human associations which did gathering and hunting during the Paleolite times. And what forms of uh, cohabitation among the people in the prehistoric period could be called a society, a tribe, a community, or anything like that. I will try to be brief as far as I have to stick to the time limit. Therefore, let me jump to the meaning of uh, human anthill, which helps to discover the term of uh, society. In order to understand what Zinoyev implied uh, as uh, a society, we have to resort to his term of a human anthill. Yuri Solodukin believed that this term helps to specify, to attain more rationality of the term of society. What a human anhil means in terms of Zinovia, first of all, this is a joint historical life of people when from generation to generation people would reproduce uh, people like them, then when they consider other people and themselves as uh, entity, common territory, uh, getting food and uh, security. Number five, external and internal identification. Human art hills are similar to packs and flocks of animals and birds, and this is uh, similar to Ant hills, human ant hill, just like the things above, are an aggregate of uh, human beings which demonstrate organized behavior, but that would outperform the previous ones by the quality and the degree of organization. Therefore, the term of a human ant hill is not similar to the society. Human ant hill is broader than a society because it would include any forms of human societies capable of independent reproduction, including most primitive ones. Um, there would be pre society, society, and super society. 
The human anthill term helps to detach the prehistoric human associations. That could be called such a word. And it is very appropriate in that sense. It means this term helps to detach these prehistoric human associations from very mature social systems with the social bonds and multiple ways of uh, division of uh, labor. What traits Zinoviev proposed to be as distinguishing features for human art hills? First of all, this is about statehood. That's the first trait or the first sign. The second trait, this is about the emergence of economy, which helps to provide uh, the whole society with the means of production and the ideology. And Alexander Zinoviev would mean that this is a complex of ideas, ideologies, and concepts, uh, convictions, and meanings, opinions of the people, about everything what now and in that case is deemed crucial to realize oneself and to realize uh, the social surroundings. So these three signs, economy, statehood, and ideology, are distinguishing the society from an earlier social association which could be called a human art hill at the stage of a pre-society. This way, to sum it up, Zinoviev suggested a new content to the category of a society, and he interpreted that differently, and it was very specific, that definition, because society, in terms of Zinoviev, this is not just a supranational social and cultural mm -hmm. entity or a social movement of a matter, society, first of all. This is a collective of people that would have certain traits and features, such as a common history reproduction of uh, those who look like them, self-preservation, etc., etc. And secondly, Zinoviev interpreted the society as a way to detach mature, sophisticated social system and society is that from primitive human associations that would exist in the prehistoric age. Zinov would call that a human art hill at the pre-society period. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Member of Zinoviev Club. From the pre-evolution period of time, our remarkable international reporter, Alexei Pankin. Hello. I carefully thought about my pre presentation. Uh, there was the smart and highly intellectual one. I will drop it and let me just talk about human matters. Olga Zinoviva, greetings from my father. My father, my father was the last great editor-in-chief of Komsomolska Pravda, a newspaper, the last foreign minister of the USSR. He was appointed as the only ambassador who did not follow the extraordinary committee that attempted the coup d'etat. And then less than three months, he was uh, removed for showing loyalty to the president of the Soviet Union. And the new authorities did not welcome that. He is also a member of the Zinoviev Club. He spoke from this podium. He used to write a lot, 
and he used to write a lot for the Zinoyev Club. He is 92 now. He cannot move around freely as he used to, but greetings from him anyway. Let me also mention the name of another great editor-in-chief of uh, Komsomolska Pravda, Vladimir Sungorkin, who passed away uh, two months ago, uh, 10 years ago, when we were getting ready to celebrate the 19th anniversary of Zinoviev. I gave him a phone call, uh, reminded him of that particular date. I wasn't sure whether he knew anything about Zinoviev. He said, in my newspaper, I have no journalist who can write about him. So if you can do it, do it. I'll give you an entire page. And then I got in touch with Olga Zinoviva, whom I had not known before. And we did a great interview together. It was very well uh, made. And back then, Komsomolska Pravda had millions of readers. And that went to Kostroma newspaper kiosks on the same day, were the same. Editor-in-chief, Komsomolska Pravda published extracts from the debates between Yeltsin and Zinoviev. And then they also kept the records of that entire discussion. I wanted to remi remind all of us of those two names. Thank you. Thank you. Introducing, introducing our next guest, a poet, a citizen, a member of the Zinoviev Club, Maxim Lavrentiev. A hundred years ago, Vladimir Mayakovsky, writing on the death of uh, Velimir Hlebnikov, uh, was writing very warmly about him. And the same can be said about Zinoviev. Back then, they talk, they spoke about reproach or reprimand, and any liar or hypocrite would reject Zinoviev's ideas, but can Zinoviev be an example for each one of us? Each one of us has their own understanding of Zinoviev. Let me speak about me personally. When, when you are creative, uh, freedom is the foundation of any sense of limitless freedom. In a totalitarian country, in a totalitarian society, not just in the Soviet Union, but in the West, when they declare their freedom, where, when in the West, freedom is fictitious. Anyway, Zinoviev defended his right to be truly free. 
and not just internally, but externally. It's a rare occasion when such people wake up and then they don't go back to sleep until they finish their earthly mission, until they write the great book of life. In our case, of a great thinker, philosopher, the giant of spirit. But we are all mortal. We all fall silent sooner or later. But if someone is not forgotten, that person is immortal. And those who follow us make us immortal. Those who want to those who go further than us. And here, he is an example. I have seen, I saw Alexander Zinoviev once, and I mostly communicated with him through his books. And I saw this example of absolute devotion and loyalty. Often women don't know how to describe their love, but Olga Zinoviev is an example of true love and devotion and loyalty. We keep helping her, and we will continue waking people up. We visited Kostroma a few days ago, and there was this full room of people. And I asked that uh, audience if anyone read the uh, books by Zinoviev, the books of fiction. Only a few hands were raised, and others approached me, promising me to read his works. We need to keep waking people up. If Zinoviev is an example for us, we need to keep keep doing what he was doing, waking people up, giving them the maximum freedom. And freedom leads to creativity in any forms. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim Lavrentov. Lavrentiev, a medal to you to celebrate Zinoviev's centenary and also the marble bust of Zinoviev. Congratulations. Most of the members of the Zinoviev Club read interviews with Zinoviev organized by a well-known scholar and member of the Zinoviev Club, Oleg Nazarov. Dear friends, in the first part of our conference, Olga Zinoviev mentioned how the warnings of Alexander Zinoviev had not been heard for a long time. Unfortunately, let me also say a few words here. I think almost until the end, people did not hear his warnings. I met him in August of the year 2000. 
we published many interviews with him, and I s still recall January 6, 2006, and we discussed Lenin for two hours and then off the record, and we were in their kitchen, and Alexander Zinoviev spent his free time talking to me. Alexander Zinoviev, it was really painful for him that his warnings were not heard. He just wanted to warn all of us, our entire society, about the pending threats that were looming in the distance, and many of our citizens did want to hear any of those warnings. That was 2005, 2006. I know we are running out of time. Let me just recall two warnings that Alexander made in the late 1990s. There were many different warnings, as many as there are stars in the sky, but the first warning let me quote here. He said that when they led to disintegration of the Soviet Union, the West wants to kill Russia off, and the territorial integrity and unity of the Russian Federation was under threat. And the masters of the global super society continue the cause of Hitler at a higher level of modern science in the form which was disguised as democracy. So Alexander Zinoviev was right back then. And those warnings were voiced during the days when on TV they kept talking about partnership in the West, when in May 2005, a year before, the death of Alexander Zinoviev, and they spoke, and they celebrated 60th anniversary of uh, the victory in 1945, and uh, they did never mention Stalin back then. It's, it was like talking about Napoleon's wars without mentioning Napoleon. And He also mentioned the final act of the global tragedy when any traces of the Russians will be eliminated from history to make it so as if this great nation never existed in the world. They are crossing out the Russians from history with a method methodical approach. And even the blind see now what really happened. And they see how he was right. And then he passed away uh, 16 years ago. It's obvious, obvious that he was right. And the West abandons their mask, and they say openly that they want Russia to perish. Russia and the Russians. And historically, when Russians, when Russians are cornered, they become amazingly efficient. That's one reason for optimism. Another reason for optimism is that the entire atmosphere changed when Alexander Zinoviev was alive. There was all this Westernism. And now it's very different. The atmosphere changed. Russian president quotes Alexander Zinoviev, and that's a great reason for optimism. Thank you. founder of the 
unique exhibition, unique Russia exhibition. This is a patriotic e event showing cultural achievements and peculiarities of our country. It's a discussion platform that shows the uniqueness of Russia globally. Here they attract attention of authorities, commercial structures, and residents of Russia. It, in January 2022, we launched the year of Alexander Zinoviev at their building. And this organization is headed by Sergei Kolomeitsev. Oh, dear Olga Zinoviev, it's an honor and privilege for me to, it was an honor and privilege to uh, celeb launch the first event of the centenary a few months ago, earlier this year, I was amazed uh, when I met you. I had never seen a person with such a deep philosophy. And this year of the centenary is important for me, not only because I respect this great philosopher, poet, and artist, but also, as I uh, talk to you, and this is not just an event, it's part of culture, which is really important to me. I want to uh, develop the Zinoyev readings at our building. It'll be an honor for me to help you organize this event. And Alexei Blinov is also present here. He will also help us. He will be doing it together with our entire team. I don't think we need any more words here. And what's important is specific activities and also a reward to you to celebrate the centenary of Alexander Zinoviev and his marble bust as well. It's a rare award, an honest award. Thank you and congratulations. Here, we have no people in this room who are here by accident. An expert and doctor of art studies, Olga Kalugina. She wrote books on the Russian art of the 19th century. We know her very well. She participates in the events of our club. Olga Kalugina, welcome. Thank you, Olga Zinoviva and the entire club for uh, inviting me to this high podium. All right, I study art and how is that connected with social philosophy? But there are real things that connect us the revision of Russia's achievements that started with the reforms of 1990s and our scholarly achievements do not exist in the West. And the formal stylistical analysis school is dead which goes into deeper structures of an art piece. At the end of 1980s, they kept saying there was no Soviet art at all. We used to have avant-garde of uh, 1910s and a bit, a bit of uh, post-perestroika art, but let's forget 
the fine art of the Soviet period, that entire humanitarian potential, the great names that uh, existed in the global history of art, they need to be erased, much like they're trying to erase Russia. And it was very difficult to confront that. From time to time, we felt being just a little tiny group totally alone. And all of a sudden, Alexander Zinoviev raised his voice to warn against such an erosion and a great mind in our support is taking our side. And this has a lot of value. This is a very precious experience. And these great achievements that used to be made during the Soviet period of time in the fine art, they have to survive. They have to still impact future generations. You see, we are doing a unique thing. Fine art performs a very important social function which cannot be substituted. This is about translating the value system to the next generations. In order to delicately and correctly interpret these values that exist at the subconscious level, our profession does exist. It is uh, not numerous, but it performs a very important social role. We are few, we are not noticeable, but when the great mind supports what we are doing, that was extremely important for us. And you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, all the warnings made by Mr. Zinoviev would come true, that was clear. And our resistance would be on the rise. We paid more attention to the preservation of our cultural legacy and translating the true values to the next generations. So this task becomes more and more relevant when the war in Donbass started. It became obvious that we are right. And as a person who for seven years goes to Donbass and knows everything first-handed, I may tell you that here we see all other dominating factors, the impact of the Russian art and the Soviet art. This experience becomes more and more relevant. And here we see the prophecies of uh, Mr. Zinoviev coming true, therefore, not just being a philosopher or being a social scientist, uh, that he is important. We value his legacy. And I'm a professor, and uh, I always tell my students that we have to study his legacy. We have to train their brains. A lot has been done in order to that it uh, doesn't happen, but I believe that we will prevail. And uh, the power will be ours. Power will stay with us. Let it be so, Ayman. A remarkable space of idea, of live ideas, not just some dystopians uh, or utopian ideas being expressed. Uh, humanism today is very rare. In humanism, this is about responsibility responsibility to what will happen next, responsibility to what will come true next. He believed in truth and he was uh, an ultimate humanist, being associated with what was going on here throughout those six hours. I understand that, that it would be great. Let it happen so that we have more and more people eager to hear these ideas, because if we speak about our society, it has to be fed with the ideas of humanism for the sake of its own sake, including individual development.
Olga Zinoviewa is a unique person, and probably this is thanks to her endeavors, to her efforts, efforts made by the Zinoviev Club. Something similar probably will be shown on the big TV screens, on the first TV channels. I'm confident that the real philosophical idea would be demanded for. Uh, by grateful TV spectators, and you know that some of the speakers today would deserve special silence and special respect in that room. And this is the main criteria of truth. Truth doesn't leave anyone indifferent. In that case, I'm speaking not as uh, an anchor of that big philosophical marathon, but I'm speaking as a performing artist, as a citizen. Thank you so much for your attention. We are concluding the year uh, named after Zinoviev, and 2022 would be over, but um, till the official end of 2022, we will have more conferences, more workshops, and uh, concerts that would be filled with uh, ideas of uh, Alexander Zinoviev and more remarkable achievements await us, something that will introduce to us the genius of Alexander Zinoviev. And it was noted in that space that the most genius thing is uh, what is simple and what is expressed simply. And these are the ideas expressed by Alexander Zinoviev. And now, let's pass the floor to a person who, in my opinion, deserves not just the round of applause, but every success, every attention to a grandiose endeavor, as been said, almost a pistol-like activity that's the producer of the Zinoviev year, Alexei Blinov. Friends, dear Zinoviev Anthil and dear intelligent men of Russia, we're entering the millennium of Zinoviev. And in order to stress that uh, era that Really, this is a whole millennium of Zinoviev. We opted for the Antic purple color. This has always been the most precious color in order to stress that glimmer and the princess armor of uh, Ms. Uh, Zinovieva. Not just the shape, but also the content is valuable. Olga Mironova opted Dezebao as a title for that collection of arts. When Dezebao was uh, first emerged in China, it was uh, just a newspaper. It was a beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Mao Zedong signed his, endorsed his first Dezebao and was uh, like a launch fire on headquarters. We call for a cultural revolution. It is a long overdue in Russia and across the border. We have to think about how preserving the peace, the world, how to preserve life on Earth. This is what uh, Alexander Zinoviev called for in his final testament. Thank you so much, and uh, we're looking forward to big deeds, big intellectual work. We realize that those who love Zinoviev loves Russia. This is the one who loves the truth and love and life. This is a simple criteria, which is pertinent to all of us. We're all contemporaries of that great person and his wonderful spouse. This is the Russian Kiras 4-2. Thank you. Thank you, Blinov. Fragile, tender, and so resilient, Alexander Olga Zinoviev. 
Alexandra Zinoviewa, a laureate of Triumph Prize. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak in front of you. I was not intended to do that, but then I wrote a whole lecture, and then I thought, no, Zinoviev would not like that. Uh, being too verbose, let me be very simple. And Alexei said that um, you can find all the clues to saving the world in Zinoviev's works. The main clue of that, so, was the main feature of Zinoviev's works. Love for the man. Well, I thought about procrastinating a little bit, but the first answer is the right one. The main feature of Zinoviev's work is that, and this proceeds from his rationale, there are no good or bad people. There are no good and bad ages. There are just people and ages. The same is true of the morality. That's a social structure, and it adapts for the people of certain specific ages, and vice versa. So it means that there is a lot of confusion. And Zinoviev uh, speaks very specific specifically. He calls a spade a spade, but never would he condemn anyone. He discusses. He teaches, but not l is not lecturing. That's a very important message. And... People will very often ignore that, or they just would like such an image of a revolutionary with a sword who would punish uh, those who are wrong here and here. But the main feature of uh, a philosopher is to drive the people from the cave of darkness to the light. And light is where there is life, and if there is no life, then everything is so bad. Therefore, the love for the mankind, love for the life, is pertinent to Zinoviev. Uh, there is no difference between love and life, uh, intelligence and reason. And I would call on everyone to reconcile with yourself, reconcile with all the lively situations. So there are a lot of negative things in the world. And we would take sides, and that's very right. But you have to remember what the great minds teach us, that love and life are most important things. Don't judge. Again, for Zinoviev, there were no just good and bad guys, and that great. Just be like Zinoviev, be simpler, and I think that we'll be friends for many years to come, and we'll understand each other. Thank you so much. Zinoviev, great Russian philosopher. Silk electrons are installed in the labs. The DNA and the electrons are filling the world, but there is no you in that world. And if you are not present, then what? What's next? Is it a religious structure? No. I pray. God Almighty. Let me be with. Let you be with me. Let you not be almighty. Not you be most merciful. Not most benevolent. Thick-skinned and deaf. But I need a little thing. Don't deny this trifle to me. Be omni-seeing, for God's sake. Please. See, just see. See always and everywhere. See with all the eyes. Let you see how many deeds have been done across the globe, pro and contrary. It is, doesn't take a lot to see and nothing more. Let it be the only thing that concerns you, for you to see what I'm doing, what they are doing. I'm ready to make concessions. It's very difficult 
to do that, but let you see at least something, at least a tiny share of uh, deeds, at least for that. Let you be living without being seen, I cannot. Therefore, I shout, I cry, Lord, I do not pray, I demand, let you be, I whisper, let you be, God Almighty, I pray, I do not demand, but let you be, Alexander Zinoviev. I was confident that we were and we cannot do that otherwise in order to finish that conference, which will be remembered in the history of the centenary of Zinoviev with his words. But the final word belongs to Olga Zinoviev. My dear friends, those who are next to us, those who create, keep the fire in the Zinoviev Ant Hill, who supports the life ideas of Alexander Zinoviev, let me tell you that I admire the course of our today's conference. I would like to apologize um, on behalf of those who didn't manage to show up because today is a busy working day on Saturday, the hall was overwhelmed. You have to gain food for your relatives, you have to think about your family. And this all will be recorded, uh, you will be able to watch that, but I'd like to thank everyone who was speaking from your heart. It's very difficult to identify anyone individually. I praise you for your reflections, for your ideas. Uh, for whatever you said about my great Alexander Zinoviev. Zinoviev is being taught and he has to be taught not just in the higher school. We were approached from Ingushetia and we didn't have any connections to that republic and all of a sudden we saw we, we heard that lectures about Zinoviev have been delivered. There are minor exhibitions and big exhibitions. That's in Gushetia, which now is Zinoviev. And we are hosted by Irkutsk. It was a remarkable event, a very far away region. We had a remarkable meeting with Rizan. We have Chibaksari. We have Veronish. We are waited for in the city of Atkengelsk, in Kaliningrad, in Ulyanovsk, Grozny. We are being welcomed everywhere. We are being waited for, not because we are so good, but because this is an opportunity for us to pass over to them what Zinoviev did, what he taught. And I don't see any great opportunity than, than his uh, 100th anniversary. I received a call from the executive office of the president, and uh, they took that coinage. They said that this is the first century or the first millennium of Zinoviev being coming to an end. Thank you. Long live Zinoviev millennium. Hooray. Friends, uh, I got the mic back. Each of you? No, not like that. And please enjoy champagne.